God's words, and the eternal word. We therefore hold that what has been said about God's oneness and his infinite eternal and spiritual essence is a question well and truly settled. But the distinction in the Godhead between Father, Son and Spirit is not easy to grasp and worries many minds. Let us then divide it into two points, the first confirming the deity of Son and Spirit, the second explaining the nature of the distinction between Father, Son and Spirit. Now there is no lack of evidence in Scripture which demonstrates the truth of each of these. When we read that in Scripture the Word of God is spoken, it would be quite absurd to imagine sounds which, cast into the air, immediately fade away, as was the case with the audible utterances made to the patriarchs of old by seers and prophets. Rather, what is meant is the perpetual wisdom which dwells in God, from which the ancient oracles and prophecies derived. As Peter explains, the Old Testament prophets spoke no less by the Spirit of Christ than did the apostles after them, and all who imparted God's truth to men. Moses, for one, insists that the creation of the world was no sudden whim of God in time, but an act of his eternal counsel, or if I may speak this way, of his permanent and immutable heart. But if his testimony seems dubious or unclear to some, Solomon puts the matter more clearly when he introduces God's wisdom, which, begotten from all eternity, oversaw the creation of the world and oversees all of God's works. John says the same thing but more simply than either of them, declaring that the word which was in God from the beginning is himself God. For in each of these two clauses he attributes a permanent essence to the word. Hence, since all revelations from heaven rightly deserve to be called words of God, we must nevertheless acknowledge that essential word, from whom all revelation flows, who is subject to no variation, who abides always in God, and who indeed is God. There are, however, some who, while not openly daring to rob God's Son of his deity, try secretly to steal from him his eternity. They maintain that the word began to be when God, in creating the world, opened his mouth to command that all things be done. But they quite thoughtlessly sin against God's majesty by fancying some new addition to his essence. For as God's titles in relation to his works were originally ascribed to him when his works began to be, as for example the title creator of heaven and earth, so piety recognizes no title which might signify some fresh event in God himself. Yet, this is the way they quibble. Moses, they say, in declaring that God began to speak, means that until then there had been no word in him. Now I ask you, because something came to notice at a certain point in time, must we infer that it did not exist before? I say the very opposite. Because in the split second when light appeared, the power of the word was made manifest. The word was already in existence. If we seek to know for how long, we will discover no beginning. For Jesus Christ, who is the Word, sets no definite limit in time, saying, Father, glorify your Son with the glory which I had with you eternally, before the earth was made. With these words, he goes beyond the whole of time and across all the years. Again, then, we conclude that God's Word, having been conceived in him without beginning, has been forever permanent. Here is proof of his eternity, his majesty, and his true divine essence.